Chapter 8 The Bridge A bridge's business is to stand and join two severed spheres of land. Riffius Chauncey Wheeler in the America Sentinel some thirteen years later. It was King Sam who started the bridge and Gordon that gave it a good push though neither one might ever know it. This rainy evening, the Wheelers were sitting around drinking green tea in the kitchen. Hardly did Sayward ever remember feeling better or laughing so much. Was it that Resolve and Faye had a young one on the way, and Hulda hadn't, which was as it should be, but not always was? but she knew that last night and night before. Was it the tea then, or why did she make so much? High Jack tonight, she wondered. After a while, Gordon said he heard they were spanning the river with a bridge at Maytown. He reckoned he would go down. He could catch a ride on Sam Hendler's boat and get a job bridging. Not till then did Sayward remember the old saying, how close laughing was to crying. You think you'd like it down there, she asked, sober. Nothing I'd like better than bridging, ma'am. He told her, you'd come back, Gordy, Massey wondered. Oh, I'd come back some day, with my pockets full. Will you bring me a present? Massey asked. I won't stop at you, he said. I'll bring you something gold. And Chauncey something silver, and ma'am something fixed with ruby stones. Sayward gave him a steady look, to show she appreciated it, whether or not it ever came true. Before she went to bed that night, she went to the shell bark box. Will Beagle made for her long ago. Not often had she looked in this since she was married. Mostly the box held keepsakes, the tattered letter her father had somebody write, a broken breast pen of her mother's, her father's and mother's marriage paper now, torn and faded from use as a window light. You could hardly make out a word any more, only the red pictures of birds and flowers, but the most precious keepsakes were the locks of hair tied with thread by her mother long ago. Jerry said she wanted something to remember her young ones by once they were grown and nothing was like a curl of their hair to bring them back. You could lift it in your hand and see the tyke that used to be. Wasn't it strange, Sayward thought, how hair never died like the rest of the body. A person could be rotted away in the ground, but his hair stayed like it was when he was alive. You could still see and feel with your fingers how he was. The whole lot weighed nothing at all in your palm. Hardly could she believe that her own head had ever been so yellow, or Jenny's hair like the finest tow. Her sister Sully's curl was soft as beaver, and Asha's coarse and black as a horse's mane. Not even in the wettest, foggiest weather would the hair on Asha's head curl, but it did in the old shellbark keepsake box. She only wished she had cut a lock from her own little Sully in time. Afterward, it was too late, when the fire had singed it to the flesh. The last curl she held up was the shaggiest of the lot, Many a time had she seen that shock of sandy hair on her brother Wyatt's head. 
law how many years had it been since she saw him, and where was Wyatt now? He had gone, and never a word from him. The country of the western waters had swallowed him up. She didn't even know if he was dead or still among the living. And now Gordon was talking of going. Of all her children, he was the closest to Wyatt, not in looks, but in ways. Hadn't she seen the signs ever since he was little? Never would he go in for schooling or be satisfied long in a job. No, he always wanted a new one. Last time it was working in a sawmill. Once he had the smell of fresh sawn boards in his nose. He claimed he'd be satisfied. That was about a year ago. Now he couldn't wait till he gave it up and went to bridging. O'Sayward knew what was the matter with him. It was his Montsey blood that wouldn't let him be. The same as Wyatt and Worth before him. He thought all he wanted was to go to Maytown. He felt sure once he got there, he'd be satisfied to hang up his hat and afterward come back to Americus and settle down. But never would he. No, let him have one job for a while, and he couldn't wait till he had another. The next time, Porteus told of trouble somebody had with the fairy. Sayward kept her counsel till they were getting ready for bed that night. Now I think Americus has put up with King Sam long enough, she said. Porteus stood in his stocking feet, his coat and waistcoat off, his white shirt bulging around him, starched and full, a mass of wrinkles and sweat stains. You want to franchise some other fairy, he puzzled. I'm talking for a bridge, Sayward told him, one like I hear they are getting down at Maytown. Porteus bent over to draw his shirt over his head, as if he didn't hear or want to hear any more. But when his face came bottom first, out of the white tunnel, his eyes observed her. I never knew you so devoted to progress before. Sayward had let the upper part of her dress down to her waist. Now she pulled on her bed gown and let it drop so she could draw her dress out from under it. That's the way she had done it ever since she was big enough to know she was a woman. So long as the old works, I don't believe in throwing it out for the new. But Americus is getting too big for a huffy old man who reckons he's king and can run his ferry just when it suits. Porteus had taken off his pants. He hung them over a chair where the legs still stood out with the dotty roundness of their master's hams. You could see those hams now, white and hairy, as Porteus stood there considering. I've been thinking of it myself, but the river's too wide here. It would be cheaper to bridge at the Narrows and make everybody go two miles out of their way. Sayward retorted, No, Americus is the place it should be. That's all she would say. She didn't hold with Zyla Harris. That woman should stand up in men's meeting and tell what ought to be done. Oh, she believed women had as much sense as the men and as much right to have their way. And as long as she knew anything, women had always done it. Why, forty years back, when there was nothing here but a howling wilderness, her pappy had to listen to what his woman wanted, and so did Porteus all his life. The men could have the satisfaction of talking it over and carrying it through, but many times it was the women 
who put it in their heads in the first place, and the place to put it in their heads was not in public but at home. Long before it came, that bridge was a wonder of the world to Chauncey. He felt toward it like it belonged to his family, like the barn or pasture, although other folks could use the bridge if they paid, hadn't his father been the first to talk of it. Wasn't Gordon going to build it, or help anyways, which meant he needn't go to Maytown to be a bridger now. Only last night hadn't their father settled the fight over where the bridge ought to be. For a while it looked like the bridge would get nowhere, for every man in the county wanted it handy to his own house and place of business. They had a monster meeting by torchlight, and nobody would give in. At last, Porteus got up in front of the crowd. Gentlemen, he said, I move we bridge the whole damn river from Tateville to the Forks. Chauncey knew those words by heart, how some men looked sheepish and others laughed, how the meeting broke up in good feeling with the commissioners setting up three men to view and survey for a bridge. Sunday afternoon, Gordon carried him over to Water Street, and Massey ran along. Right here, Gordon said, the commissioners wanted to put the bridge. Will it go across the whole river? Massey wanted to know. Clean from this side to that over there, Gordon told them. Chauncey's gray eyes trembled and strained. A man on the far bank looked littler than the trained monkey a dark man brought through Americus last week on a chain. Between here and yonder yawned a wide gulf with nothing save space and air to hold anything up. I can't see a bridge right here, a man standing by told Gordon. I can't see it myself yet, Gordon told him. Now never had Chauncey seen a bridge, save for small rumbly ones over the race, and yet he could look right out there and see it in his mind, hanging over the river though what it hung on he didn't know. One night he dreamed he saw keel boats floating over him in the sky. What made them stay up he didn't know, but he could still see them in his mind, and that's the way he could see the bridge, with horses and wagons going across it. Not only that, but teams of oxen and herds of cattle, sheep and hogs trotting over it, whichever way they wanted to go. The bridge wasn't even started yet. King Sam had a case in court against it, claiming it a foolish and malicious scheme to persecute him and ruin his fairy business. And yet Chauncey could see it hanging so high over the water that birds could fly under. He could see it still plainer in his mind when they started to put it up. Now it was like a long house with sides and a roof to keep off the rain. He couldn't tramp that long ways to the river himself but he could hear Gordon tell about it when he got home. The little fellow would close his eyes, and there all would be in front of him. He could see the river a-shining and keel boats and barges moving up and down. He could hear boatmen cursing the bridgemen, for they didn't like bridges or fish dams, Gordon said. Sometimes he could hear a friendly boatman play his fiddle or blow his horn as he floated by, 
or see King Sam come out of the back door of his fairy house and shake his fist at the bridge, while all the time oxen pulled timbers into place, or came toiling back from the woods, splashed with mud and dragging wagons, loaded with butts so heavy they bent down behind to plow furrows in the ground, or so Massey told. Chauncey could see that bridge better, sitting at home in a dark corner, than if he was there. A couple times, when Gordon went back after dinner, he took him over. All the noise of hatchets, saws, axes, and mallets confused him. The voices of drivers bawling at their log teams, and of bridgemen pounding where they hung like squirrels far out over the water on the dangerous scaffold. Their cries came so deep and urgent, it sounded like they were falling in the water. Every now and then, Chauncey froze, for he heard a splash. He felt sure it was Gordon and wouldn't sit down again till his eye found him safe on the great golden caterpillars of fresh-cut timbers. For one day, Mr. Jackson's axe had fallen in the river, and for two shillings, Gordon had dove into ten feet of water to get it. Back at home, Chauncey could climb all over the bridge and scaffold, but here it made him giddy just to look at Gordon standing on a single log high over the dark water. When he was here at the bridge, Chauncey liked mostly to close his eyes. He would breathe the smell of the fresh-cut timbers and hear the old men a-talking. They sat around him, boring the dirt with their canes and speaking a mysterious language of words like gin poles, trussels, cribbing, false work, and block and tackle. The word they and Gourdon <coughs> used that took him the most was the cord. The way they talked, the cord was the heart and master sinew of the bridge. They argued which was better, trusses or arches. Was the footwalk better on the north or south side? And if the bridge was heavy enough for loaded ox teams? On one thing they agreed, that it had more timber in it already than a frigate. That it would cost a pile of money and take a long time to pay it off. Even the minister would have to pay it across, they said. Some had the toll all figured out. Foot passenger, one pence. Ox or horse, four pence. Horse and rider, six pence. Cart, sleigh, sled, wagon, or chase, and one horse or ox, nine pence. Same with two horses or oxen, thirteen pence. Same with four horses, twenty pence horned cattle, three pence sheep and hogs, two pence. And that was the way it ought to be, they said, for a sheep or hog was worth more ready money than a man. Oh, those old men knew everything, Chauncey told himself. It was a shame they couldn't build the bridge. All they said they backed up with stories of some bridge they built or crossed back in the old states. Two span were nothing grand in a bridge. They said, old Mr. Tenafly told of one back in New York State, of four spans of yellow pine with two roadways, one for going and one for coming. And lame Mr. Troxell said he walked many a time on a bridge across the Delaware with five spans. But the longest span of any of them knew was in the state of Vermont over the Connecticut River, 239 feet, with not, not even a pier below, 
Now that was something Chauncey would have given much to feast his eyes on. A house of wood stretched and straddled across a river, and the middle never sagging or falling in. Chauncey liked to hear the names of those rivers back in the old states, the Kennebee, the Yugahaney, and the Monagala, the Susquehanna, and the Brandywine, the Merrimack, and the Rappahannock, but the prettiest sounding was the Juanita, the Blue Juanita, Mr. Troxel called it. The sound of any one of those names brought the river it stood for right up in front of him, a wide reach of water, like he dreamed about last year. He could still see that river clear in his mind. It was blue as indigo, so blue that even the air over it shone with a bluish light. The wild buffalo standing in it had blue legs from the water. Never had he seen such a beautiful color, and it was a wide river, too. You could hardly see to the other side. He reckoned it must be the blue Junuata. But when he told his mother, she said you could throw a stone across the Juanita any place, and never was it blue, for she had lived on its banks and washed in it. When it wasn't a dirty brown, she said it was green. Till it was over, Sayward told herself, she would be glad to see the end of that bridge after all. Oh, it had kept Gordon around his hometown a while longer, and they had all learned plenty about bridges. Even little Chauncey kept harping on them, but it was Gordon who acted the master hand. Telling them how he'd a done it different if he had it his way. More than once he said he told Mr. Jackson how the bridge ought to be. That's impossible, Mr. Jackson would say. Taint impossible, Gordon claimed, he said back. But old Jackson would never listen. He couldn't take a point from anybody. He always gave the excuse that if he done that, the bridge would settle when he pulled out the last trussle. Now, if he Gordon had been putting it up, he wouldn't have hired any men who got fits or giddy. What's more, he would have hung that bridge high. It might have made a steep pool for teams up the bridge hill, but it would have let boats run under it, easy even in flood time. Many an evening she sat mending his bridge clothes, and listening to his bridge talk. The rub was that about the time she and the others got ready for bed, where Dawn was just getting ready to go out. Where do you have to go at this time of night, Gordon? She'd ask him. Oh, I just said I'd be out with the boys a while, he'd say. His while lasted, as a rule, till two or three o'clock in the morning, and when he came through her and his father's room to go to the loft, he left a reek of rank cigars and bar rooms behind him. Now Porteus always had a smell of pipe, and jugs around his person. Even in the night, in his bed, he gave out a scent of tobacco and spirits. He wouldn't have been Porteous without it, and she was so used to it she reckoned she'd find it slow to go to sleep without it. Why, when she fetched their bolster in from airing, she could always tell which was his end just by laying her nose to it. The scent of spirits would be mostly gone by that time, but not the sourness nor the bite of the sharp weed. And yet when Gordon came home after putting in a night with the bridge gang, he left a trail of stale tobacco and foul liquor behind him that put his father to shame. Well, she was only getting paid back for pushing 
that bridge before its time, she reckoned. In her heart she knew she had done it mostly for spite and cowardice, spite against King Sam and cowardice to let her second boy go off from home, a bridging. Now she could see what you got for putting in your nose where it wasn't wanted. But never had she expected she'd get punished as hard as she was and poured on in the bargain when he wasn't to blame. Before the bridge was done or even the scaffolding knocked away, Hulda told her the bad news. Well, Resolve's not the only family man now. Did Gordon tell you he's married? Married, Sayward stopped mighty short. Who to? Something that's no good, Libby put in. Sayward looked around at the other girls. The worst was written on their faces. What's her name? Effie Clouser, and she lives up in Fishtown, Sooth said. Sayward's heart sank. She tried to remember somebody of that name in the scrubby-like shanty settlement up the river. She knew now where Gordon had spent his long evenings. She's a slut, hold a spat out. Sayward turned on her sternly. Who are you to say such a thing, or any of you for that matter? I can't believe yet that Gordon's got a wife, but if he has, remember, she's your sister. Through supper that evening, Sayward let her eyes rest on her second oldest. Could this be true, what they said about him, of all her children? Save her littlest, Gordon was the one least fitted to stand up for himself in life and get what he wanted. He was good enough company. His black head would throw back and he could sing most every catch Jenny could and some that she couldn't. But never could he take care of himself like Jenny. He let others impose on him, would stand it till they pushed him too far and then look out. Something in him would snap. He lacked the staying part and balance the others had, like he lacked all their ten fingers and thumbs, one of his having been chopped off when he was little. Is it true you have a wife, Gordon? she asked quietly, when, save for Chauncey, she had him alone in the kitchen. Oh, he flushed up at that and bumbled around. Yes, it's true, ma'am, he said. Aren't your father and me good enough to be told beforehand and asked to your wedding? It's not that, ma'am, he begged her. It just happened so quick. I hardly knew it myself beforehand. She stood there pitying him. Well, you and her have any good wishes, she said. I hope you'll both be happy. When are you going to bring her down? One of these days, he promised. I'm a-moving up tomorrow when the border gets out. I'll bring her down soon as she'll come. Say her new ma'am wants to meet her. Sayward said kindly, Tell her she needn't fret. Gordon took his things up to Fishtown next day to stay. Plenty times he stopped in back home after that, and usually around meal time, but never was his bride with him. When Sayward asked, he claimed Effie was bashful and couldn't make up her mind, but Jenny said likely he felt ashamed to bring her. Though Sayward waited patient enough, never did she come. At last, Sayward told him that if Effie wouldn't come to see her mother-in-law, she was going out to see her and take along her wedding present, but she didn't want to come unbeknownst. So she set Saturday afternoon. That would give Gordon's bride time to have her house cleaned up and herself washed and dressed for the coming Sabbath. Meanwhile, she could spike her own girl's mouths, but she couldn't Jenny's. 
most of what she heard she didn't like, nor how ravenous Gordon ate when he came home. Carefully, she wrapped up in some of Porteus's paper the same present she had given Fay, a pair of linen sheets of her own raising, spinning and weaving, and an embroidered bolster case. Oh, nobody would say she was not as nice to a poor daughter-in-law as a rich one, but she complained to herself that the Lord took it out pretty hard on her and Gordon for the small pride she had in Resolve's fine marriage. Chapter 9 The Dream I was just a thinkin', and if I hadn't been a thinkin', I wouldn't have thunk that way. Little Matthias Cottle in the Fields The little fellow lay in the entry. Every time they threw hay down the ladder hole, a little of it stayed on the entry floor. The fork could not pick it all up for the manger. <clears throat> it was too short or stubby, or it was seed or chaff, or the fine powdery hay dust that sifted down like gray snow from between the mal planks and hung on the ghostly cobwebs. In time it covered the floor with a springy carpet, so you wouldn't know there was plain hard earth beneath. On this springy carpet, face downward, Chauncey lay, and when they called his name from the back door, he gave no heed that he heard. His sisters were always bothering after him. Chauncey, where are you, Chauncey? Are you all right? So that's where you've been keeping yourself. Didn't I tell you to put on your wamus before you went out? You're as pale as a corpse. Come in now and lay down a while. Come in and wash your hands. Dinner's soon ready. Come in and see your Aunt Jenny. Come in this minute. It's going to rain, and if you get wet, the distemper will carry you off like the eagle and the little red hen. Not that his mother ever said this, but it must have been she who sent them out to look for him. In the house, he seldom had anything to do. He had to sit all day tongue-tied as a trout and listen to his sister's chatter. From morn till night it went on, and never a let-up. They sat up to their talk like hungry men to their dinner, but never did they get full. It went all the better when their hands flew. They would throw words over their shoulder or cast them up from their needle or loom. Their tongues were loose on both ends and tied in the middle. Chauncey believed. They kept it up at such a rate, gossiping and complaining, jeering and laughing, fighting and singing, all at the same time, till it made his head go round. They wore him plumb out, but never did they get tired. Oh, what wouldn't he give to have his brothers back in the house? Kinsey had left him first, and all he saw of him now was his scrawl in a letter. Then Resolve went to live with Fay, and now Gordon, the last brother he owned, had deserted him bag and baggage for Fishtown and left him alone in the cabin with all the women. Of course, his father still lived here, but mostly he was not at home. Chauncey, where are you? It was Sutha calling, and she sounded mighty close. He struggled up and stood on the feed measure to climb over the edge of Hector's manger. Then he tumbled in and lay mighty still, with his heart pounding while somebody came in the entry door and called him again. Yes, it was Sooth. She went around, 
every place in the barn looking for him, but she didn't think to look in the manger. When she went out, peace flowed slowly back in the barn again. His heart let up, and the world stopped going around in circles like it did when he stood up in too much of a hurry. He hadn't meant to fall in the manger, but now that he was in, he wouldn't trade it for his bed in the loft. He had hay under him and a cradle around him, and could look out the wide cracks and see daylight coming through chinks in the logs. He could look up and see the gray tents of the spiders, caught with dust and chaff. They minded him of bird wings about to take off, a lifting him with them. Now why was it he couldn't sleep at night? but could in the daytime, especially if it was a place and time he shouldn't, with the rain on the roof singing to him, and his cradle a-rocking when he closed his eyes. The cow was red with milk-white udders. It stood behind the stable and waited for him to climb up. Then he rode it over to town through the square and up and down Water Street. People looked and smiled at him to see him riding a cow. A driver couldn't get his oxen up the bridge hill. So the red cow gave milk in a big brass kettle, and the driver drank it, holding the kettle up with both hands, and after that the oxen could pull their load of heavy green logs up the bridge hill easy enough. The leaders, with their heads down, picking their way, carefully step by step, into the strange dark tunnel, till eight beasts, wagon, logs, driver, Chauncey, and the red cow all hung over the middle of the river. On the bridge walk and shore, the people held their breaths, but the bridge timbers only creaked and groaned. If it stood for that, it would stand for anything. Mr. Jackson said, and now the boy could go back to the house with his red cow, for it looked like rain. When Chauncey heard the rain on the roof, the cow had gone. At the entry door of the barn he saw the water coming down in sheets. He could hardly see the house. Likely that's why he went the wrong way and fell in a pool of water. But he told himself he would have been wet to the skin anyway from the rain till he opened the kitchen door and heard his sisters cry at him. Chauncey, where have you been? We've been looking everywhere for you. Take off your things. You're wetter than scalded chicken. What were you doing all this time? Chauncey suffered them to push him to the fire and pull him this way and that. His shirt came off and then his breeches, drawers, shoes, and stockings, till he stood there a grotesque little old man, gaunt as a plucked banty rooster, gaunt with cold, bending down as far as he could to hide his nakedness. He said not a word, only made faint sounds of grief and protest, as they rubbed his wobbly body one way or another and jerked at limber limbs that wouldn't stay stiff enough to have stockings pulled over them. Now you better tell us where you were. Libby threatened, buttoning his dry blouse and pinching as punishment some of his cold skin into the buttonholes. I was out in the stable, he said meekly. Oh, no, you weren't. I was out there just a half hour ago. He considered. He hadn't heard Holda, only sooth. That must have been when I was over in town. How did you get over there? I rode over on a cow, he said gravely. Now, why did his sisters have to set up such a honking like Lady Winter's geese when somebody came in her yard. Who put you up on a cow? Chauncey thought. Nobody. I got up myself. It must have been a mighty little cow. 
Whose cow was it? Ours? Libby jeered. No, I never saw it before. Well, was it an old or young cow, and had it any horns, and what was its name? It didn't have a name, I think. Did anybody see you with this cow over in town? I wasn't with it. I was on it. Chauncey corrected her, and lots of people saw me. They were strange people, but they smiled at me. If you'd asked them, they'd tell you. How can we ask them if we don't know who they were? Where's this green cow now? It was a red cow, said Chauncey. I rode it back to the stable, but it's not there now. They all made those crackling sounds again. No, I guess not, and never was. It was, too, Chauncey said mildly. Then he turned and saw his mother listening. Her face looked uncommonly sober. Chauncey, I've heard a good many wild tales from you. Now I have nothing much against them. You can make the girls believe them all you like, but you're getting to be too big a chunk of a boy to believe them your own self. You're old enough to know now what's real and true and what's make-believe. Now I want you to tell me real and true where you were this afternoon. She looked so formidable. He let his eyes <clears throat> go a bit out of focus, and that made her look less so. Just a brown blur in the haze of whitish light from the window. I rode over to town on a cow, he told her. You can't expect me to believe that, Chauncey. Her voice came back at him, just as quiet and mild as before. In the first place, folks don't ride cows, and if they did, it wouldn't do them any good because cows are contrary. If you ever tried to take one any place on a rope, you'd find out they won't go where you want. This one did, Chauncey declared stubbornly. I rode it up and down Water Street and through the bridge. Mr. Jackson saw me. He said I better go home now. It was going to rain. A kind of slow bleakness and pain spread over his mother's face until her eyes were blue stones set deep in her sockets and drawn far away. Mr. Jackson isn't here in America, Chauncey. He's down in Hamilton County, somewhere putting up a bridge. Gordon had a letter from him just yesterday, wanting him to come down and work. Now, I don't know why you say you saw him and rode a cow. Maybe you made this up. Maybe you were dreaming. But whatever you did, you give me no other way than send you to bed. You can lay up there a while and study this thing out. When you reckon you know enough to tell me when you're make-believing or dreaming, you can come down. If there was one thing Chauncey hated more than another, it was to have the ignominy of putting on his bed gown when it was still daylight and going up to the loft before supper. Desia took him and all the time she stood over him. His lip quivered. Then she went down, and the door to the wind sweep closed behind her. All he could hear was the faint flow of voices from the faraway kitchen. They could have a good time together, getting supper, and he had to be up here alone. When the sound of laughter reached him, he felt himself shrink. They were laughing at him and his red cow, and they wouldn't laugh at him long. He would run away. He would search the world over for his true mother and sisters, and when he found his mother, she would be a lady with pale golden hair. She would take him up in her white arms and kiss him and thank God for his safe return. She would tell how she had missed him all these years. He spent among alien folk who refused to believe his truest words. All night... Like a lighted candle in his mind was the memory of the little girl whose father laid his hand on Chauncey's head and cried, and they were his really true father and his sister, and that's why his father had cried.
because he had to go back to Chauncey's real mother without him. They lived somewhere across the river. Their name, Chauncey, didn't remember, but it would be a fine name. He knew, like Davenport, or Pemberton, or Ormsby, most likely Ormsby, for that was the name that always rang silver bells in his mind. By morning, the rain had stopped, but the girls said that the river was very high and still rising, and they all wanted to go to Aunt Jenny's to see it, all save himself, who said he didn't feel good enough to do anything except lay on the couch. But once they had all left, he put on his cap and made his way, best he could, out to Wheeler Street, beyond the barn, where a countryman in a cart took him along to Water Street. Here a little crowd stood watching the strong press of high water, where it almost came up to the bridge. The brown flood moved so wide and silent and queer, like something in a dream, and suddenly it struck him. Could this be a dream like his mother told him to watch for? He remembered Massey tell of a dream, once where she couldn't stop or go back, but had to walk aboard over high water with one white shoe and one black one. And now, all at once, he knew it wasn't real, for coming behind him to cross the bridge was a wagon with a white horse on one side of the tongue and a black mule on the other, driven by a strange-looking man with one good eye and a red patch on the other. The wagon had a step in back, and when it moved slowly up the bridge hill, Chauncey waded in the water that flowed across the road and climbed up and in. Hold on there, said the driver, looking around. Where do you think you're going? I'm going home to my father and mother and my little sister and all my other brothers and sisters who pray for me every day to come home, Chauncey told him. And where do they live? the man asked, surprised. Far over there, on the other side of the river, where the woods is thick and dark and lonely to live without me. What's their name? It's Ormsby, sir. Ormsby, he muttered and shook his head. Well, I'll take you as far as Kettering's store, and he can tell you how to go from there. Chauncey lay back in the wagon box. They were in the tunnel of the bridge now, and the dream was a very clever, deceitful, and hard-to-tell dream, because it was just like it had been in real life. Yesterday, when he rode the red cow through the bridge, the hole of light behind him grew smaller and smaller, till it was only the white eye of the town looking through a dark telescope after him. Then at last it started to grow light, and they were getting out of the tunnel, where a toll house sat right on the bridge, cribbing with no front yard, save the roadway, and no backyard, save the river, over which some wash hung. The pole was down, and the toll-keeper's woman came out with her mending in one hand, and took toll with the other. I have to collect for him too, she said, pointing to Chauncey. I pay nothing for my folks, the driver protested. No, but he's not your folks. He's a foot passenger. He could have crawled on your wagon just to get out of paying toll. He's only a little tyke. He's a foot passenger just the same, and the law says foot passengers have to pay. My father will pay you, Chauncey called. He'll pay you a dollar. He'll be so glad to see me when he sees me. The sharp face of the woman moved around to the side of the wagon, and at her look, Chauncey remembered how she had once thrown the pole down on a driver who forgot to stop and pay, and had knocked him off the seat of his wagon. Who's this? She wanted to know. Ormsby, he says, his name is.
So, it's Ormsby now. It used to be Wheeler, unless I miss my guess. Lawyer Wheeler's boy. Chauncey saw the driver's astonished face. He's not my real father, the boy said. No, who is then? My father is Mr. Ormsby. The woman clicked her tongue, looked at the driver, and back to the boy. Who told you? It's true, Chauncey said solemnly. What does your mother say? She isn't my real mother, either. She's just been keeping me for her. The tollkeeper's wife looked suddenly angry. Now that's enough from you. You go back and tell that cock and bull story to your mother. Come on, get out and go back before they close the bridge on you. The yellow road looked so near and free. Chauncey climbed down and tried to make a dash for it, but the tollkeeper's wife caught him and sent him reeling back on the bridge. He ran till his heart stopped him. When he looked around, the wagon had vanished into thin air, and all he could see was a white cat in the road where the tollkeeper's wife had been, and that showed still more that it was unreal for he knew how, in a nightmare, people turned into animals, and animals into people, and one kind of thing into another. His heart still choked off his wind. He had thought for sure he was going to die. But now that he saw the cat and remembered nothing could hurt you in a nightmare, his heart let go of his throat. He could breathe again, and everything grew light and airy, as it should in a dream. Twice the little fellow halted and looked around. The wagon of his friend, with the patch over his eye, was still invisible. But the white cat lay on the pole that stretched across the middle of the road, and that was the tollkeeper's wife watching him. The third time he turned, the cat was gone. Quick as he could, he stumbled into the shelter of the wall of timbers, that rose beside the roadway. Here were endless nooks and crannies to hide in. Cubbies and cubby holes, already brown with dust, although suspended over the dustless water. Here were thick timbers and supports, and the thickest was a great arc of half a dozen timbers fastened into one, all bent and curving like a bow in the sky. This was what held the bridge up. As he climbed the easy sloping arc, a stage rumbled through, and he could feel the gentle quivers in the great flexed wooden muscles under his hands. This was a master place to be, he told himself, lying flat on the top of the arc and looking out on the swollen river. Sometimes it looked like the river stood still, and the bridge moved. It made him drowsy just to see the bridge go upstream over the halted water. Now what was that rapping and knocking, he wondered. After he napped, he looked down inside and saw water flowing over the planking of the bridge. It scared him a little, even though he knew it wasn't really true. The fantastic pounding and groaning the weird hissing and wailing of the river as it boiled up white through the cracks in the planking. He imagined in the sounds of water that he heard voices, a great many voices swelling and receding as the great ark under him rose and fell. They sounded so real, like in waking life, when he heard a camp meeting or torchlight procession. But now, he told himself, he could tell his mother that at last he knew when he was dreaming, for never could that which was happening at this moment be true. He could feel the bridge lifting, lifting. His ears were deafened by a terrible crashing. The bridge seemed to be turning over and over. Then the whole world, and he with it, went down deep in the water breaking into pieces as it went. What happened to the world he didn't know, but he felt something rise up under him, like a great terrapin coming to the surface, and when the water ran from his eyes and was coughed 
from his nose and pipes. He found himself stretched out on the terrapin's back that was a shell of the bridge floating like an old leaky scow bottom on the flood. He could see the houses of Americus over there and the shoreline black with people back where the bridge had been. Only the unfamiliar wide flatness of the river met his eye. O oh, Chauncey lay there on his raft and watched the town as long as he was able. Once he thought he could make out the cabin he lived in with the barn behind it. Just for an instant it stood there. Then the revolving wheel of the town shut it from view. Another time he thought he saw boats push out from shore, but they soon turned back. The flood ran too fast, and they had to leave him to the river. Already he had gone so far that Americus didn't look like itself any more. It was just a smudge vanishing back yonder beyond the hills. All morning he lay gently rocking, riding his raft of bridge work, breathing the soft smell of the river and watching the country move by. He looked amazed on all the woods and fields and hills he passed, creeks opening their mouths to the river, horses and cows, barns, houses and mills, some of them standing knee-deep in the flood, and to think that all these were nameless, vaporous, with no more reality than thoughts and pictures in his mind. Wasn't it fearful how a dream could turn out such an endless lot of things and never repeat itself, all being different? How long would the spectacle last, he asked himself, and how long would he have to lie here, half in water and half out, holding on to boards and timbers, afraid every moment that a worse part of the dream was still to come. The middle of the afternoon he looked up and saw a town ahead, a bridge like Gordon helped to build at home spanned the river. Now he told himself his dream was nearly done. It was fetching him back to Americus, and there was the bridge unhurt all the time. First thing he knew, he'd find himself waking up in his bed, in the loft over his pappy's bedroom and office. He could see the walk <clears throat> on the north side of the bridge, lined with people, and he stood up to see if he knew any. They all shouted at him, but he couldn't make out what they said. Oh, this was most like a dream. Their grotesque yells and the faces they made and gesticulations, but not a vestige of their meaning could he get. Just in time he lost his balance and flattened himself on his raft. For a fleeting moment he saw a row of faces bent down toward him. Then he shot beneath with only a foot to spare, but not a face had he seen that he knew. And when he came out on the other side, he sat up and looked around. Here the flood spread out, like a great brown sea across which a boat with two rowers came swiftly out to meet him. The frontman, who smelled of chewing tobacco, lifted him in the boat and passed him, dripping like a fish, to the other man, who set him on the back seat. Then both men bent their backs and oars upstream for shore. Where'd you come from, boy, and what's your name? The frontman said. You mean my old name or my new name? That's really my oldest name. He asked them, for he thought that since he was back home, they better take him to the house for dry clothes. What's that? The man said surprised. The back rower held an unlighted pipe between his teeth. Far ahead was the bridge, and now the town began to look strange, for Chauncey couldn't see his Uncle Will's boat yard, and besides, the town was on the wrong side of the river. How did Americus get over there, he asked. 
This is Forkville, the man with the pipe told him. Is that its real name, or just in the dream? The man eyed him. What dream? Aren't you in a dream then? Chauncey stammered. Or are you real? We be, said the man, biting his pipe stem gently. Would you mind if you'd do me a favor? Chauncey begged him. I'd like it if you'd give me a pinch. The man watched him carefully, keeping on rowing for a while. Then he reached forward and gave the skin of the boy's leg a blistering squeeze between thumb and forefinger. Ouch! Thank you, Chauncey told him. Now I think I know that you are real people. And who are you? The rower in the front seat wanted to know again. Ormsby, Henry Ormsby, Chauncey said. That's my really true name. The men eyed him strangely, though they said nothing, and presently the little fellow wondered if you couldn't expect people in a dream to admit that they weren't real. For never did he see... Such an unreal town like this one they took him to. Built in the water instead of on dry land. And instead of walking or driving, they rode him up the street to a fine brick house where they talked from the boat to a lady and left him. She was a small lady with very black hair, except over her ears where it was white, and she had a gold chain with a cross around her neck. First, she gave him a cup of hot brandy milk that made him gasp from the fire. Then she carried him upstairs to a room with sloping ceilings, so low at the side that she couldn't walk, except at the windows, which were carved out of roof and plaster. All the time she took off his clothes and dried him, and rubbed warmth in his legs and arms. She asked about where he lived and his people. Finally she laid him in a bed with four yellow posts and white and yellow curtains, hanging like great butterflies on the side. Here she brought him china dishes to eat out of and a tall china pot to sit on and make his water in. The door had an iron latch, which he heard it lift. He would open his eyes and see strange faces there in the hall staring at him. He lay the rest of the afternoon and whenever he looked, he found the yellow and white curtains still above him and the white china pot still under the bed. When evening came, the room was soft in the candlelight. The bed post looked rich and golden, and the flame of the candle shone in the polish like stars of pointed fire. He had come to this room only a few hours ago, and already it seemed like he knew it a long time. He might even have been born in this room, he whispered to himself, and the lady with the gold cross, who was so good and tender to him, might be his secret mother. Now why did his brother have to come down from Americus and spoil it? There's a man down at the door, Henry, the lady told him the next morning. He's looking for a boy called Chauncey Wheeler. They think he came down on the flood. Chauncey closed his eyes quickly, but he could feel the lady waiting. After a while, he got out of bed and went to the window. Had he not known the dream was over, he would know it now. The water in the town was gone, leaving mud over everything. In the street by the front door was Hector and his father's chase. And on the muddy step stood Gordon. Oh, he would know that familiar, homely figure anywhere in his muddy red shirt and his pantaloons stained with water and mud. Suddenly, the man below looked up and saw him at the window. Chauncey, that you, are you all right? The next minute, he came bursting in the house 
and ran up the stairs a-calling. Gordon's honest joy at finding him alive sent the pity into the little boy's heart. Never would he tell him that he wasn't his real brother. All the way out of Fortville and north toward Americus, he let Gordon pour out his talk to him. What were you on that bridge for when it went down? You ought to know better. I told you all the time that bridge wouldn't stand high water. I kept telling old Jackson, but he wouldn't listen. What were you doing on it anyways? I was lying on the ark, Chauncey said carefully. I noted it. The tall woman said you were off. She claimed you got back through in plenty of time, but other folks said they seen you go down the river. All yesterday, I wished I was with you. I tried to get to Forkville ahead of you, but it took too long the way the roads were. Then I had to stop every place along the river and ask if they seen any drowned corpse come down. I sure would a hated to go in and find you laying out in the shed with a gunny sack over you. What would they have a gunny sack over me for, Chauncey wondered. So they wouldn't have to look at your bloated up face and belly. That's why I couldn't get to Forkville in time. If I had, I'd a got out on the bridge. Then I'd a waited for you to come along. I'd a watched my chance and dropped on your raft when you came out from under just to keep you company. Me and you just stayed right on and gone down the river. If we got thirsty, we could drink river water. We could have seen the country. You could have got off if you wanted, but not me. I just stayed on till I seen the Gulf of Mexico, and I'd never come home again. Why wouldn't you come home? Chauncey asked him. But from then on until after dinner time, Gordon was silent, like a bittern that called only in the morning and again toward night. He said little or nothing through the middle of the day. All he talked when they passed teams or folks was to brag Chauncey to the skies. Late that afternoon, <clears throat> he started talking to the boy again. You're only a little feller, Chauncey, but let me tell you something. Never get mixed up lawful with a woman. Not even when I'm grown up, Chauncey wondered. That's the worst. Have nothing to do with them, or you'll reckon other women might be no good. But you got the master woman. You'll be soft to her. You'll give her all you have. Sometimes she'll act real nice to you and say nice things. You'll reckon you're the luckiest man alive and her the finest woman. Then sometimes you'll come home unexpected and find something you wished you hadn't. Mush again for supper, Chauncey guessed. Worse than that, you know what song I used to sing. One night I come a ridin' home as drunk as drunk could be. I seen a head on the bolster where my head ought to be. That's what you'd find, somebody sleeping in bed with your woman. The little boy thought it over. I have to sleep in bed with a woman sometimes. Wordon clasped him affectionately on one small knee. You could have slept in bed with my Effie any time you wanted. Any time you wanted, Chauncey, and I wouldn't have minded. Either, you're no dark diddler. What's a dark diddler? Chauncey asked. Don't you know yet? Well, your pap was a dark diddler once on a time. This was a good while ago. Kinsey and me was up in the brush and seen him. What did he do? Well, he did something to a woman he had no right to and hadn't ought to. Isn't he a dark diddler now? Not that I know of, but that don't excuse him any. He ain't left off that easy. He was a young one by that woman running around right here in Americus. And she ain't much older than you. Is it Massey? No, it's not Massey. She's got another ma'am than we do. Now I don't want to tell you who she is, or you might say something, and maybe she don't know it yet. 
but I used to pass her when I went downtown, and when your pap goes down, he sees her too, and don't you forget it. You can guess what he thinks when he sees her running around and called by another name than Wheeler, and all the time he knows she's a full daughter to him and that other people know it too. Hector was about played out when they came through the Narrows and could see the first roofs of Americus ahead against the sky. Some boys saw them. They came and looked in the chase and then ran ahead. Gordon said it was to tell the news that little Chauncey Wheeler was still alive. By the time they reached town, women stood out in front of their houses to see them go by. Young ones ran a piece alongside <clears throat> to hear Gordon tell the story. Just before they reached the boat yard, the cannon up at the ferry house boomed out. That's for you, Gordon told the little fellow. Will Beagle was out in the street now. Aunt Jenny came running to kiss Chauncey. Tears spoiled her face like she was kissing the dead. By the time they got to the square, a whole company of children ran beside the chase. Massey among them for a minute and then streaked out for home. All his sisters stood near the barn on Wheeler Street, waving handkerchiefs to greet them when they turned in the lane. Chauncey looked up the stretch of wheel tracks. There, at the end of it, at the door to the kitchen, stood his mother. Even at this distance, the boy could tell that her face was cruel with secret feeling. Panic seized him. Don't tell her I went down the river on the bridge, he begged Gordon. She'll claim I'm lying and put me to bed and I won't get any supper. But Gordon wouldn't listen. Chauncey couldn't understand how they believed now all the unbelievable things that happened to him, and yet they wouldn't the time he had just ridden over to town on a red cow. His mother cooked him and Gordon a special supper, and his sisters stood around, piling more on their plates than they could eat. All evening, company came to hear the story told again and to make a fuss over him. The minister thanked God Almighty for guiding our young Noah on his humble ark and preserving him from a watery grave. Never had he seen his mother like she was tonight, meeting everybody at the door, greeting them like they hadn't seen each other for a long time, swapping words and talk, listening to the girls tell over and over again what had happened to Chauncey, pouring refreshment to all. It seemed like she couldn't do enough for everybody who came. Now, what made her like this Chauncey wondered it couldn't be Jubilee over having him home again, for only once had she hugged him, and that was when he first came. Had she been his real mother, she would have caught him up many times and told him how she loved him, covered his face with kisses. It was toward morning, and all were in their beds, when a rapping came on the law room door. Whoever it was had to rap twice, but Chauncey heard it the first time. Who's there? his father asked. It's me, Collier, a voice at the window said, and Chauncey knew it was the sheriff. Is Gordon here, Mr. Wheeler? Gordon, he wouldn't be here, Porteus said. Then he must have turned his face toward the bed. Or is he, say word? Chauncey could hear his mother sitting up in bed. Gordon's <clears throat> not here, Mr. Collier. What did you want him for? Could you tell me where he is, Mr. Wheeler? Why, out at Fish Town. He lives with his wife's folks and went home around midnight. 
Is he all right? As far as I know, ma'am, but he had some trouble out there on account of his wife. It happened about one o'clock this morning. I'm sorry to say he hit the man with a stool, and the man's dead. For a minute, there was heavy silence downstairs, but that don't sound like we're on, his mother said. I guess his wife wasn't much good, Miss Wheeler. The sheriff apologized. He's had a good deal of trouble with her on account of this old border of hers. I understand he came home early this morning and found him there again. The two had a fight, and then Gordon lit out. Well, if he's not here, I reckon I'll light out too. Wait, Collier, Chauncey's father said incisively. I want you to come in and make a search as you would any other place. I'll help you. Oh no, I'll take your word, Mr. Wheeler, the sheriff told him. Chauncey heard his father pull on his clothes and leave the house with the sheriff. Where he went to, the little boy didn't know, only that it must have been nearly morning because he could hear their rooster out at the barn crowing loud and clear, while far off in town the other roosters answered him. When the crowing stopped and daylight came in slowly by the window, slow, terrible sounds, half aloud and half in whisper, rose from downstairs. The little boy crawled to the loft hole and saw his mother on her knees by the bed, her head down, her hands locked and straining. She still had on her bed gown, coarse and rumpled around her. The bare feet and legs that stuck out of it looked heavy, knotted, and indecent. He drew back quickly. It was as if he had been looking on something he shouldn't. Ever before had he seen his mother strong and unvanquished. Now she seemed humbled, debased, beaten down like the runaway black woman he heard tell of that a Kentucky sheriff took back to slavery. Did Gordon mean so much to her then, he wondered. Yes, for he was her own flesh and blood. She could cry out and pray from the depths of her heart for him. If Gordon came back now, she would take him in her arms and tell him how much she loved him. But she couldn't do that for her youngest, though he had come back from a watery grave, for she wasn't his real mother. Chapter 10. A Posy for Porteous All at once she lifted her body and flung her head to the great sky that reached over the hills and shouted, Here I am, the time of man. This was the summer that sickness came to Americus. Some called it the plague and some cholera saying that it came across the sea from the hot countries, and that seemed likely to say word, for the hottest month here was the worst. For three weeks you didn't see a house fly or hear a bird. Where they went, too, nobody ever found out. Anselm Lingle at Robox died in four hours, and a Harris boy, whose married sister wouldn't let him in the house when he came there sick, was found dead on the river bank in the morning. Most of those who caught it were poor folk, but Dr. Persol's wife lived in a fine house, and she took sick-handing medicine to a patient. While they helped her to her bed, her face turned black, and before they could get the doctor home from the country, she had stopped breathing. Dr. Persol said her death was so fast, and the contortion of the muscular system, so powerful that the extensor muscles of her arm lifted it from where it was folded on her cold breast and laid it full length in his lap as he sat by the bed a full hour after life was extinct. 
It was a very bad time for Americus. Forty were carried off in one week, five out of one cabin, and nobody would go in to get them out. The council had to appoint a committee of citizens to oversee burying of the dead and set the death beds out in the street to lime the sidewalks and attend to those in distress. Sayward had to steal herself when she heard Porteus's name was head of that list. Jenny said they might have picked somebody who didn't have nine children, but who else could they get that took the part of the underdog like Porteus? Sayward asked herself. She hated to see him go into the hill cabin with John Quitman and two of his half-drunk keelboat men to fetch out the five bodies, but nobody else would go in for love or money, and somebody had to do it. When Porteus fell sick, the first thing Sayward thought of was little Chauncey. He took everything that ever came along, and now God's black ox must surely tramp him, for even the stout and hearty seldom overed the plague. Porteus himself was given only 24 hours to live by, Dr. Persall, but when the old England doctor came around next morning, Porteus was still among the living, and so was he the third day. The doctor never told Sayward, but he did General Morrison that he was out of cholera medicine that day, and all he could give Porteus were pills rolled out of red pepper and asafetida. So it must have been the liquor Porteus drank all his life that saved him. He was too pickled and preserved by alcohol to die. It went all over town, and the taverns did a mint of business during the plague. Jenny said it shamed her to hear it, but Sayward got down on her knees and thanked the Almighty for whatever it was that saved Porteus and the rest of her family, too, for another of hers that were round here took it. She didn't know about Gordon, for only God knew where he was at. It left Porteus mighty weak, but at least it left him in his bed and not in the grave. And now the hot drought was broken by thunderstorms. Folks began to say that they heard birds in the fields and saw house flies around again. So the worst was over, but Porteus looked terrible, the color of ashes. Today Sayward was with him by the bed attending to his wants. When through the open doors to the wind sweep, a faint knock sounded on the kitchen door. The girls had Chauncey out while they worked in the truck patch, so she had to leave Porteus and go. That was a picture not easy to forget, leaving Porteus feeble and laden faced in his sick bed, and coming out on this delicate, tender young girl standing by the door with a bunch of garden flowers in her hand. Her slender legs looked like they never belonged in that coarse gray calico dress she had on, and her white face had the singular shape of one of her blossoms. Washed and rightly dressed and combed, she would be oddly beautiful, Sayward thought. Now the little girl just stood there, not saying a word. You're welcome to come in, Sayward told her gravely, and when the child had as gravely entered, you live around here. Over along the river, she said, and her mouth, as she said it, looked sensitive as a wild thing. Now who did she look like? Sayward racked her brain, or where did she see her before? I feel sure I know you, but I can't call your name, Sayward told her. My name's Rosa. Rosa what? Rosa Tench. The sound of the name gave Sayward a turn. For a minute, she just stood looking, so this was the child conceived in sin by the pretty schoolmistress, who they said looked like a hag now, who would not set out 
foot of her house since the babe was born, nor would she wash her comb. Why, the girl was no bigger than Chauncey, though she must be a year or two older, and now Sayward knew, with the feel of knife in her side, who the girl looked like. Did the girl know it too? Her face quivered. I brought some flowers for Mr. Wheeler, she said, very low, holding out her hand full. I'm sure he'll be much obliged to you, Sayward told her, stolid as could be, taking them from her, stealing herself, hardening her hand toward the soft, clinging feel of those fingers. Now how much did the child know, she wondered. Did you bring these your own self, or did somebody tell you to, she asked. My father told me the girl's eyes were like the most delicate of wide slate gray liquid curtains that threatened to be torn down. And was he feeling all right when he told you? Sayward kept on, her face bitter. For hardly could she see Jake Tench in his right mind doing this thing. No, he was very drunk, she whispered, shrinking. So that was it, Sayward thought. She could see it better now. Oh, this was just the trick Jake would play on some highly respectable big wig like Zephan Brown. Send a bastard child to him with flowers when he was sick. But Jake would have to be mighty tipsy to play it on his own foster child and Porteus. Why he had threatened death on any who told Rosa that she was not his own, or so she heard. He would blow a tattletale to hell, he said, for even a broad hint. Right then she thought she heard Porteus calling and remembered how she had left him. You want to take a chair till I get back, she asked. She set the flowers in a crock and went to the front room. It took longer to get Porteus straightened out than she reckoned, until she got back to the kitchen. Hulda and Libby were there, but no sign of the younger girl. Where is she? she asked them. Do you know who that was? Hulda leered at her. Of course I know. What did you do to her? We didn't do anything, Libby said. We just looked at her, that's all. But her face said, that sent her home a-flying. I can guess how you looked at her, Sayward said sternly. She went to the door, but Rosa had vanished. It vexed her that she had to stay so long. Why it had so bamboozled her to see the girl here. She had hardly said a word on her own account about the flowers. Now she picked them up and set them in a smaller crock, first dipping the crock in water. Then she wiped off the crock and took it to Porteus's room, setting it on his desk, where he couldn't help but see the flowers from his bed. Tomorrow, when he was better, she would say to him, Little Rosa Tench brought these over for you. Chapter 11 the two diggings. The sons of revolutionary sires, some of them sharers of the great baptism of the Republic, make the anniversary of their country's freedom a day of ceremony and rejoicing. From an oration by Porteus Wheeler. You could tell when Porteus was himself again. Then he would call Chauncey Noah like he did for a while after the bridge went out. Noah, how's the old boatsman today? He would say, Sayward wished Chauncey would not look so unhappy and helpless. That only made his father say it again next time. What he ought to do was give no notice he had heard. That's the way she did when he called her playful names, mostly Juno. Now what's Juno, she asked Resolve, one time he was home. She was the consort of Jupiter, the god, 
Resolve told her. What did she look like? Sayward asked, suspiciously. I never had the pleasure of seeing her, Resolve said, smiling, but I think she was supposed to be on the plump side. I thought so, his mother nodded. So that was it. Porteus taking a dig at her, and at the same time giving himself a puff. She could be Juno, the fleshy consort. But he was Jupiter the god. Well, if he liked it that way, it was all right to her. Never had she seen him so high as lately. Oh, he carried himself grave and dignified, as usual, but inside he was pleased as a dog with two tails and a silver collar. Times were good for Americus. The tide of improvement rode high, and Porteus sat on top, for now he was made lawyer for the new canal company. They were running a ditch to join up the English lakes and the Ohio folks like Will Beagle and John Quitman were wild for a canal, then boats need never halt for flood or wa low water, but go about their business till ice shut them in. Porteus talked canal to all who would listen. He could recite the bill they passed in the legislature far better than the Lord's Prayer. The act to provide for the internal improvement of the state by navigable canal canals, he called it. Now, if the town trustees wanted it, you'd think they'd know where to put it, but they fought over it like they had where to set the bridge. Some said the canal ought to run straight down the middle of Water Street with a roadway on either side and the sidewalks cut to five feet, but how would the mills get their power from the race then, or their tail water into the river? The canal would be in the way. If they didn't decide soon, Porteus said they'd wake up some morning and find the canal had passed America's by. He kept pestering Sayward. Would she sell the canal company a right away through the farm? Sayward set her mouth. Oh, she knew what he was after, trying to get her to give up the cabin and live in town. She had more than one lot left on the square, just in case and on purpose, but it took money to put up a new house and she wasn't ready yet. On the other hand, neither did she hanker to stay living here at the cabin, with canalers hollering and drinking and carrying on a short ways from her door. Some of her young ones were still of mighty tender years to listen to broad talk, and worst of all, she didn't like to see such good, rich ground like hers dug up and ruined for ever raising anything on it. But she told herself she might as well have given in at the start as at the finish. She woke up one winter day and found state men and engineers surveying and appraising her good bottom land. They didn't want just a narrow strip now, but a whole canal basin. O Porteus went out and made like he never heard of such high-handed doings. He argued up and down with the engineers, but Sayward wasn't fooled. She hadn't been born yesterday. If the canal company lawyer wouldn't have known about this, she asked herself, who would? She even reckoned that Porteus had put them up to it, only she couldn't prove it. In the end, she made up her mind not to fight the whole state and town to boot, so long as they paid a fair price and didn't try to cheat her. But Porteus better walk straight from now on. 
she wouldn't forgive him easy after this. They had already dug a good part of the canal farther up north. Now, the 4th of July, they were starting work down here. A monster jubilee would set it off, have to celebrate independence, but mostly to break the first canal ground in Shawnee County. Sayward didn't have to go uptown to see the parade, because it would wind up right here in back of the house. Right this minute, she could hear the Tateville Cornet Band marching up Water Street and the America's Drum Corps coming down Union Street and turning at Wheeler Street with their fifes squealing and their drums rolling through the square. And now she could see Major Hawking, the marshal on his iron gray, and behind him the veterans of the revolution, each one it looked like in different regimentals. It ought to be the other way around, Sayward thought. Those poor old men on horseback and Major Hawking on foot. And now it sounded like the fifes were marching right into her kitchen as they turned down the lane. She could stand here at the door and see them all go by. Dr. Hainman, the chief engineer for the canal, and his helpers with their surveying instruments, all bright and polished. Behind them came General Morrison, flanked by two honorable plowers, guiding a plow laid on its side and drawn by pedicords two white oxen. After him marched Judge Devanter and Senator Voorhees, trundling empty wheelbarrows, <clears throat> and behind them the Honorable Harold Burchard and George MacKinnon, President of the Select Council, each with a spade on his shoulder. Now what was the matter with her? Sayward abused herself, curling a lip at these. Men in high hats, playing at sweat and labor. They couldn't help it if their soft white hands hardly knew which end of a plow or wheelbarrow were the handles. General Morrison was a good friend of hers, and relation besides. She had no business picking on him. She reckoned it was this tearing up of her land that galled her. The truth was she had no taste to look at them when they reached her meadow where the canal basin was to be. Some folks already stood waiting, and many more, especially young folks, ran alongside the paraders, but they were nothing to the crowd that swept after, like a river of folks from, from town. Lucky the hay in her own field had been made early and the wheat in the other harvested and hauled off, even if the heads hadn't filled out right yet. For now she wondered if those two fields would hold the crowd. Never had she seen such a company of people. Why, they must have come from all over, Shawnee County. They were still pouring like through a sluice gate, from the square coming from Water and Union Streets, where they had watched along the line of march. She could see them in her mind's eye a swarming over her cornfield and potato patch. That cornfield and potato patch didn't belong to the canal company and never would if she could help it, and yet they had to be tramped down in the cause over the heads of the crowd, she could see Dr. Hainman sighting through his transit and waving this way and that to his rodmen and chainmen. He was making like he was running a line, locating a few rods of the basin, but everybody knew the canal and basin had been laid out and staked long ago. After that, General Morrison and the other honorable plowers 
each turned up a furrow with the white oxen. The two canal commissioners received the spades from the bearers and threw some ground in the wheelbarrows. The judge Devonter and Senator Voorhees ran the barrows up on a platform built for the occasion. That's the way they made a canal bank, Porteus had said. The crowd smiled to see those big wigs in high hats running their wheelbarrows up the boards. Now they gave three hurrahs, and some held their ears for the salute of the military. But Sayward didn't hold hers. She felt too glum. This was her ground. They were tearing up. Her pap had settled it, and she and Porteus had cleared it. For thirty years or so, her own hand had helped plow and seed it. Well, she reckoned all good things come to an end some time. She just felt glad her father wasn't here. He'd be liable to take a shot at them. Of his whole family, she and Jenny were the only ones left, and now they could know how the Indians felt when the white men ran them off their land. Oh, she buttoned up her face and went with Porteus to the Independence Day dinner, out there under the bower. They had poles set up and laid a cross on top with green brush. Under the green, boards were laid for a long table and benches. Only the special guest could sit down and eat. The worst was that she had to sit there and listen to toasts praising the tearing up and ruination of her land. The chief canal commissioner gave the first. The 4th of July, the worthies of the revolution on this day commenced the system of internal improvement by breaking ground on the line of our political independence. So that was it, Sayward told herself. Before they got through, they would have God Almighty making the first canal with his flood and Noah a-building the first canal boat. Down the line, the toast went. The state of Ohio, the governor of Ohio, the canal commissioners, our soldiers and sailors of the late war, the memory of Washington, Sayward heard them all stonily. Even Washington, she told herself, was not the father of his country any more. No, he had to be the father of public works and internal improvement. Porteus gave one of the best of the day, she had to admit. Our ladies, the only product of Ohio we do not want to see exported. She hadn't realized before that toast what a hard face she must have been making not till he turned and bowed right at her in front of all the company and gave her such a nice smile. It was like he might mean all the women folk of Ohio in general, but in particular she was the one he had in mind. She felt the nerve strings and tendons of her face give in. It minded her of the night they were married, and she was so provoked at him for going to bed first. Now she told herself she could never go in after him. Then she saw that he was holding back the blanket for her, and his eyes had a look in them as toward a lady. She had heard how sometimes one of the gentry did polite things such as this, or helping a woman over a log. Now today, at the Canal Jubilee, she guessed what he was being nice to her for, but better than that, not give a height. He knew how she felt and was trying to make amends. All that summer, Porteus acted mighty thoughtful toward her. Inside, she knew he was pleased as a basket of chips over the canal, but for her sake he tried not to show it. Especially, he watched out not to puff the canal too high when she was around. Instead, he would give it a dig. It got so that when company in the house praised the canal too much, he would nod sagely. 
Yes, it's a summer that will go down in America's his history. The summer of the two diggings. Two, the company would say, where's the other one? You mean you haven't heard about Jethro Cox, Porteous would ask. He is one of the most solid citizens we have, and very well known. He wanted to help in the expansion of our young city, knowing the shortage of houses for immigrants. He built one next door to his own, very nice home, and put it up for sale. There was, I believe, no privy, but he promised to supply one, an immigrant from Maine by name of Tom Henderson, bought the house and paid for it. Now, I'd like you if you'd build my privy, he said, but Cox claimed he didn't know anything about such an article. There's nothing in the deed about a privy. He said, if you want one, you'll have to build it yourself. Well, of course, this immigrant, Tom Henderson, did want and desire the article in question. He brought the deed for me to read, and I told him regretfully that Cox was legally sound in his contention. Well then, Henderson said, I guess I'll have to do the building myself. Now, the line runs fairly close between the two houses. Henderson looked the ground over carefully, and doubtless, after discussion and due agreement with his good wife, he started to dig a hole at the front fence corner beneath Jethro Cox's parlor windows. It wasn't long until Cox came out. What are you doing there, he asked. Why, I'm digging for my privy. Henderson said, but you can't do that in your front yard and under my parlor window, Cox said. There's nothing in the deed about that, Henderson told him. Yes, Porteous used to end his story. If we had more self-reliant freeholders like Tom Henderson, Shawnee County would be better off. Quite a few of our citizens, when they heard about it, turned out to see him dig. Indeed, some of the select council came and watched. They agreed with me that there was no ordinance that could stop him. Cox shut himself up in his house for a time. Now, in view of the fact that the building he was erecting would be practically on the street front, Henderson wanted to do the right thing. He had louder milk the carpenter make him a very serviceable and appropriate door with slats below and various figures cut out above so one within could look out and see the sky and know that all was well with the world. In fact, he based it on my suggestion. In any event, when Cox saw that door, it smoked him out. He claimed that according to their verbal contract, it was his sacred right to supply the privy and choose its site. He wanted to put it back at the alley, but Henderson said that was too far on cold or rainy nights. I believe they compromised halfway back in the garden. You can see it there now yourself if you walk down that way, but they never could agree about filling in the hole at the front fence. Henderson claimed it was Cox's responsibility, and Cox said it was Henderson's. So far as I know, the hole is still there. Sometimes I think it's more pointed out and talked about than the canal.